Thank you, John. Good Lord, I had no idea there would be so many people. Well, the last time I did this, I didn't need these. So, I'm going to begin by actually reading a short section. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? No? It's this one? Sorry. Technical difficulties? No, just need to get a little closer. A little closer, okay. Not yet? Can you hear me now? Okay, okay. In August of 1882, these two men met. It's not turned on? <laughs> okay. Is this, is it on? Are you okay? Okay. In August of 1882, these two men met on Smith's Point here in Manchester by the Sea. They were completely different individuals. The man on the left was George Nixon Black, Jr. He was Boston's largest taxpayer in 1882. He was a new moneyed man, and he was looking to buy a piece of property. The man on the right was Cyrus Bartol, the Reverend Cyrus Bartol, who was a bit of a Manchester character. People here in Manchester <coughs> may know who he is. He was a transcendentalist minister, um, and thus had dealt with people like Thoreau and Emerson in his career. And he owned lots of land in Manchester that he was looking to sell. You might think that Mr. Black was the more ruthless of the businessmen. You would be wrong. Cyrus Bartol was the more ruthless of the businessmen and the more hard-headed of the businessmen here. Mr. Black was always more of a romantic. So in my book, I'm going to begin by imagining what this particular encounter was like. And in that, you can think about what it was like for Mr. Black to be imagining the house that he hoped to build on that, as yet, unbuilt on site. The site had never been built on. It was just a big, large, open area, beautiful site by the sea. This property has a cave, Nixon asked. Yes, but I wouldn't go scrambling down there in your city clothes, said the old man seated in the wooden chair in the middle of the grassy meadow overlooking the sea. He then laughed and gave Nixon a wide, squinting smile. A leonine mane of white hair encircled his face and was complemented by a white beard and side whiskers. In his black serge clergyman's clothes, he looked like a nobleman with a ruff in an old Dutch painting. The Reverend Cyrus Bartol was 69 years old this August 1882, and he'd ridden out to Manchester, a newly fashionable coastal town northeast of Boston, to show Nixon a property he had for sale. Charming and eloquent, Reverend Bartol, who lived near the Blacks on Mount Vernon Street in the city, had made quite a prudent investment in real estate in the last 10 years. At about the time of the great Boston fire, the popular transcendentalist, apparently unable to transcend the value of a dollar, <laughs> bought up acres of beautiful coastline around this one sleepy town. It was now parceling it out to newcomers, like Nixon, for much more than he'd paid. This bright, hot August day, the Reverend Bartol sat in the kitchen chair he brought with him, enjoying the view, which was unsurpassed. The six-acre parcel was a dramatic headland with few trees and plenty of bay, sumac, and juniper, which flourished right to the edge of a jagged cliff, reddled with crevasses, tide pools, and reportedly a cave. The open ocean land lay far beyond it, dark water turning turquoise where it met the distant sky. At the far edge of the property, Nixon could see his sister Agnes in her blue and white striped skirt and her parasol, happily picking at some flower growing there. Seventy feet below, the waves struck ceaselessly, a perpetuity that today seemed to him like a miracle. A house built here would dwell in water and wind and would have a life of its own, like a silent creature known only by the sound of its breathing. Hours it would spend wrapped in nights and fogs, years of days both long and short, a thousand rains would fall on its roofs, dawns would creep through its shutters, ships would pass, ringing their bells, trees planted here would struggle to grow amid the salt air and the squalls, sparrows would flit and sing from the roof ridges and foray into nest building near the time of blossoms. In the late summer, in still afternoons, insect music would become until the evening dews washed their songs away. Regattas of white clouds would cluster and scatter, black walls of thunderheads would bulk up along the horizon, Lightning would brighten midnights and storms would bring devastation. Favorite plants uprooted, shingles torn off and scattered in the far grass. Heat would come and glitter off the windows and the waves and sear the rocks. Gulls and fishing crows would scream and quarrel. 
The porch would drum with hail and frame the view of stars spilling away from the cliffs, the motionless moon trailing its light path made unquiet by the sea. In the winter, the house would be a sleeper, shutters latched and furniture drowsing beneath sheets. Snows would pile on the pathways and curl in the drifts around the chimneys. Water would freeze in the eaves. Rust would come and mold. Woodwork would creak and snap in the sunlight and again in the frosts. Spiders would spin their soft white eggs in cornices. Books would fox. Mirrors would begin to shed their silver. The house would wait, not lonely, for the beings who left their gloves curled in the cupboard and boots in the pantry and the coat in the closet that never felt right worn anywhere else. Underneath it all, Nixon imagined the cave, cool and dripping, filled with seaweed and shells, feathers and cast up stones. Hold out on the cliff below, it was like a secret, a small piece of a rescued past known only to him and savored like a photograph hidden between the pages of a book. In the winter, the cave would be coated in ice. In the summer, the home place of little brown bats who would head out into the gloaming with their snapping wings and squealing voices, wheeling and diving, seeking the bugs that crawled and thrummed against the screens. I accept your offer. I would like the property, Nixon said. The corner of Bartol's mouth twitched slightly, and Nixon watched as the elder man let his eyes run across the horizon dreamily viewing it perhaps for a final time. You'll be happy here, Bartol said. Nixon did not reply to this unexpected sentiment, and Bartol began to rise from his chair, which Nixon steadied while offering the old minister an arm for support. I know your father, Bartol said, having risen to his full height and resting his hands on the back of the old chair. Your investment will be a sound one, even at my price. The smile was again bestowed, this time with twinkling eyes. After all, the good Lord only created so much shorefront property. <laughs> and that is indeed a quote from Cyrus Bartol. He, he did say this, um, not to Nixon necessarily, but I'm sure it was on his mind. He was that sort of person. So uh, that is how I imagined it perhaps happening. Oh, I need these. So who was? George Nixon Black, who was this man? This is perhaps the first picture that any of you have ever seen of him. You probably have all seen Cragside living here in Manchester as you do, such a famous house, but you've never seen him. Well, here he is <coughs> in the prime of his life when he's probably at his most happy. Um, he was a 44 year summer resident here in Manchester. Uh, the way I discovered him, the way I sought him out because he is little known was to start actually with the old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. I went to his will. When you're 86 years old and you have no near relatives, who do you leave your money to and why? Who are these people? So in the Suffolk County deeds, I found his will and there the story unfolded. The family feuds, the people he loved, the people he didn't, uh, the, the charities that were dear to him, uh, the lovers secreted from his past. It was all there, they were just names then and I trailed the names down through genealogy and through visiting with uh, relatives, descendants of these people, and out came stories, out came letters, out came diaries, and then when placed together with primary source material, passport records, um, birth certificates, death certificates, you begin to get a picture of the man. The way I actually did the research was to keep a book, and I had a page for each month of his life, and whenever I found out any tiny thing about him, I wrote it down on that month and then pieced in what was happening in Boston. So I find out that when a beloved partner dies during the same week of the height of the influenza epidemic, what does that feel like? So you put together the true history with the things that I knew that did happen to him and imagine myself in his place. That's how I discovered him. That's the way I went. He was, among other things, a great patron of the arts and the only twice in his life did he ever have his portrait painted and both times he chose unknown female artists. This is one of the portraits. This is a miniature portrait by Laura Coombs Hills. People here may know Laura. She lived in Newburyport. This is actually a three inch high ivory miniature painted with just a few hairs of a brush. Um, she was a skilled uh, miniature portraitist and she didn't paint very many men actually, mostly children and women. Uh, Nixon would have adored her style and this is him. She asked him apparently to uh, pose in his fur coat when she painted it for him. But this is a, she became much later quite a famous artist. So 
George Nixon Black, and I'll call him Nixon from now on because that's what he was known as. His father was also named George Nixon Black. So to distinguish him from dad, he was always called Nixon. Nixon at about age 14 or 15. Here he is in Ellsworth, Maine, uh, a painting apparently commissioned by his parents. I don't know who the painter was, but this is him. He was born July 11th, 1842. He lived in Ellsworth, Maine. He, he was born there, and he lived there until the age of 17, 16 or 17, with his parents and his two sisters. He was the grandson of one of the richest men in Maine, certainly the richest man in Ellsworth, and one of the richest men in New England. Ellsworth at the time was a, a timber port. It was known mostly for timber harvesting. Uh, his grandfather, John Black, was a great uh, millionaire due to the harvesting of timber. And uh, that's where the family made its initial fortune, although the, the vast majority of the family money came later. But that was where the pump was primed, so to speak, for the family. He was certainly born into great privilege. Indeed, he was actually born with a silver spoon in his mouth because there is a receipt at the Woodlawn Mansion from the grandfather buying a silver spoon to be engraved with Nixon for his grandson. So it is literally true that he was born with a silver spoon. <laughs> The man who bought the silver spoon, John Black. This is the grandfather. John Black came from England. He immigrated in the late 1700s. He came to work for the, as a clerk for the Baring Brothers banking firm in London. He was meant just to keep his eye on the hundreds and thousands of acres of the Penobscot Million, the great tract of land that was owned by the Baring Brothers Bank at that time. He was a, a lowly clerk, and, uh, but he had an eye for the bottom line, definitely so. And he realized that the land in Maine was not going to be of any value to settle. The land is poor, you can't farm there. He thought that what you need to do is, is to begin farming it for timber, cutting it for timber. And of course he was right, and he was exactly the right time when many of the cities throughout the United States were burning at various fires and they had to be rebuilt. And so he rode the timber, the timber tycoon era all the way to its end in Ellsworth, Maine. And, uh, that's his basic story. He was a very shrewd, very hardworking man. The father of eight children. One of those children was George Nixon Black's father, George Nixon Black Sr. And um, there was a family feud, which actually influenced entirely the way that the family, the fortune was passed down. John Black lived in this house. This is Woodlawn. This is in Ellsworth, Maine. You can visit it today. It is still there. It was gifted to the city of Ellsworth or to the Hancock County trustees by Nixon when he died. He used it as a summer home in July. He went there for his birthday. And, but this is where his grandfather, John, did indeed live. Although John didn't move into there until he was in well into middle age. His children grew up elsewhere, and he only lived there with one child. So the house never had a large family in it, which is one of the reasons it's in intact and such good. <laughs> it's, it's, it was not all beaten up by children. <laughs> but there was indeed a huge family feud. John Black, near the end of his life, his wife predeceased him by four or five years. And when um, she died, less than a year later, he married his wife's niece. His wife's niece was 20 years younger. John Black was at that point blind and quite infirm. And half of his children were not happy about the union. Uh, basically, there are some letters at Woodlawn that say, none of my sons will speak to me anymore. Uh, part of the family would really not have anything much to do with the father. Again, they were angry about this second <coughs> marriage. I found a letter from the era gossiping about the second marriage from the 1850s. Um, this is something that is not in public record much in Ellsworth. Nobody tells this story. But when he married the second wife, Frances Hodges Wood, the family really violently split apart. Some of the sons just wouldn't have anything more to do with the father. George Nixon Black Jr.'s father, George Nixon, continued to deal with his father and be quite happy and actually liked the second wife, Franny, very much, as did Nixon. Now, whether that was self-preservation, whether they had a reason to like her, this is lost to history. Although Nixon held her in his heart the rest of his life and stood up for her very strongly. So his opinion was she was fine. I can't find anything about her that said that she wasn't, but it seemed odd at the time to be marrying a very sick old man. Didn't do her much good. He died three or four years later, and she spent the next 25 years alone in this house, um, much cast out by many of the people in Ellsworth. So it wasn't really, 
a great life for her at the end of it. Uh, she was here for many years by herself. But again, one of the reasons the house remained in such good shape. She was there for years alone. The house was willed to her in life tenancy, but it was actually willed to George Nixon Black Sr. So that is why out of eight children, this house goes down just to one. Ellsworth was a pretty rough town in the 1850s. It was a frontier. It was on the edge of the, of the uh, forest of Maine, a vast, untamed forest. It really was a frontier town. It was a boom town in lumber, and there was a lot of tensions over various kinds of things. It was growing a little more than it could handle. One of the big things that happened in Maine in the 1850s was Maine was a hotbed of the Know Nothing movement. Uh, the Know Nothing movement was basically an anti-immigrant movement, could be akin to some of the things we hear today. It was people being afraid of immigrants, people being afraid particularly of the Irish coming into Maine, and there was a lot of violence about them. John Black, the great patriarch, was with, through his banking connections in London, often sent money back to uh, four Irish people that worked for him, back to the families in Ireland. And so he was a target. He had some of his uh, oxen killed. There was violence. There were arsons. There was all kind of problems of locally amongst that. The man who bore the brunt of this historically in, in Maine was this man. His name was John Baptist. He was a Catholic priest. He came to Maine from Switzerland. He was a Jesuit priest. He came to preach to the Penobscot Indians and the Irish Catholics and the French Canadians that were in the area. And he wanted to start a Catholic school in Ellsworth, which he did. This caused some problem, particularly when a lot of young Ellsworth women who were non-Catholics decided they kind of were interested in the Catholic Church and began to go to services there. This was not appreciated. And then uh, John Baps also caused a local fight by wanting the Catholic Bible to be read in the schools in Ellsworth. Uh, the town school board ended up taking him to court over this. There was a large lawsuit which incidentally the lawyer who stood for the town against John Bapps was Richard Henry Dana Jr., <laughs> another one of your Manchester people, the two years before the masked man. So he actually came to Ellsworth and fought against John Bapps. Well John Bapps, his unfortunate life what happened to him is he was incredibly in the 1850s tarred and feathered in Ellsworth in a vicious tarring and feathering by more than 100 to 150 citizens of Ellsworth got together and just said we're going to tar and feather you. They threatened it in the newspaper. They actually wrote it in print a year about a few months before they did it and then when he showed up in town again they actually grabbed him and did it. This happened when George Nixon Black Jr. when Nixon was only 14 or 15 it happened about 150 feet from his house. So I'm sure he knew all about it, and much of his later life makes me think he did know more about it than people realize. So this is part of the environment in which the blacks, which this young man is growing up in. You know, he's very wealthy, but it's a very rough town. And um, after that happened, the family decided that they might ought to move to Boston. The children were getting old enough, they needed to be going to better schools, and they were able to see in Ellsworth, and Nixon was ready to go into college, or, and so they, they moved away shortly after that happened, the Baptist incident. John Baptist incidentally recovered from his wounds and he went on to become the first president of Boston College. <laughs> Lest you think that it is purely the hooligans in Ellsworth who caused the trouble, I will tell you that it was not. Many of the leading citizens were stirring up the brew against John Baptist and other people. One of them was a man who lived in this structure in Ellsworth and uh, this is one of the, of the finest buildings in Ellsworth, but he did live here. And uh, he was uh, one of the ones who mostly stirred it up. It, the, the tarring and feathering took place on this man's wharf. And I'm just showing you this picture now for later reference in my talk here. <coughs> it's probably good for me to note that uh, because the actual incident with John Baps took place because of a book. You want to remember that later in the lecture as to what actually ended up with that property in Ellsworth. This is Nixon's father. As near as I can see, all he did was slave and work all his life. He was an incredibly hard worker. I think he felt um, responsible for his brothers not liking him anymore and him siding with the father. He felt that he needed to always deserve what he had earned, and as near as I can see, he worked himself near to death. He just worked all the time. He never took vacations or trips. Um, he was a fair and even man, I think. He was a good businessman. 
he took his portion of the estate, despite the fact that John Black was no longer talking with some of his children, they all split his money eight ways. There was not tons and tons of money. They were quite wealthy, but eight ways, it was not a lot. Um, George Nixon Black Sr. took his eighth, moved to Boston, and began to invest in Boston commercial real estate before the Civil War. This is where the money really came from. The Blacks owned great swaths of real estate in by the 1860s and 1870s in Boston. Huge, all commercial properties in, in Boston. George Nixon Black Sr. reluctantly left Ellsworth, actually. He didn't really, he had a hard time moving away from Maine. That was hard for him, but he did come to Boston, and I think he was never quite perfectly happy once he had left, but he felt he needed to. When the family first moved to Boston, they stayed for a short while in Pemberton Square, which some of you will know where it was. It's not there anymore. It's under the, um, one of the court buildings in it now. And then to 81 Mount Vernon Street. This is where they lived initially from, 18, uh, from uh, 1860 to 1882. This was the house. Still there. This is an 18-year-old man. It's amazing that uh, this is George Nixon Black four years after that fresh-faced young portrait of him earlier. Uh, what happens to somebody in four years in their adolescence? He, no one can believe this is someone who's 18 years old, but it is. And what was basically happening was poor Nixon, who was schooled in Ellsworth without a bit of Latin or Greek, was pushed into Harvard and expected to keep up. Uh, that was not gonna happen. Nixon just couldn't memorize, he couldn't recite, which was what the curriculum was at the time. He had a terrible memory, as near as I can understand. And at this point in his life, this is his Harvard yearbook picture, he was failing at Harvard. He was also entirely taken up with the fact that this is 1860 and this Civil War is brewing. He doesn't know where he's going at this point in his life. He's confused, he's failing, he's a failure to his father. And he looks every bit of what he felt, I think, at the time. Uh, he, the only little fib I ever found in my research was he actually left a note saying that he left Harvard because of eye trouble. If you look at the history of the 19th century, every man had eye trouble. It's, clearly, they didn't. It was just a euphemism for every other kind of adolescent problem. But <laughs> he had eye trouble. He didn't really have eye trouble. He was the only student who failed his freshman year. He was the only student who was asked to repeat his freshman year, and he never went back. He was probably too embarrassed. His father withdrew him from Harvard, and he never continued. He never went back to school again. He was also, at this time in his life, deeply in love. The object of his affection was this young man. Poor Nixon was also gay, on top of every other problem he had going on with him at the time, in a period in which nothing about that was known. There was no template for behaving that way. He didn't know. He was deeply in love with this young man. It's probably time to talk now about the Nixon, the black family status. The blacks were incredibly wealthy. He, the family was much more wealthy than this man, who was Francis Welch, crown and shield. However, he was the height of blue blood society in Boston and Nixon's were the Silas Laphams of Boston, the, the, the people who had come from outside. And they were completely different classes, even though the money was much stronger on the Nixon side. These two men went to college together. They met at Harvard. Frank Crowninshield was nearly as poor a student as, uh, as Nixon, not quite as bad. He did go to Boston Latin, but it didn't do him much good. And, um, <laughs> He had further problems. He himself probably didn't reciprocate Nixon's love. He had other problems. He was dying of tuberculosis. It was a disease which was hidden from everyone. It was hidden within the families. It was considered a family taint, a trait that was passed on and on. And he thought that he could actually save his life if he joined the army, joined the Civil War. Because in his mind, you go out. It's like two years before the mast. You go out in the, in the strong air. You work physically, and you will get your lungs back if you don't get shot first. Uh, anyway, that's what he believed, and he did indeed join the, um, the army. He was on the second Massachusetts. For a while, he was in the same group with Robert Gould Shaw, who people know about. They were friends, and uh, he was the son of Edward Crown and Shield and Carolyn Welch. But by the time he joined, he was already well onto the road of tuberculosis. This is his mother, Carolyn Crowninshield. She's from the Salem, uh, his father was from the Salem Crowninshield family, of course. Carolyn was a Welch. She became a great friend of Nixon and a mentor to him. She was one of the great female friends of his life. 
Nixon actually did um, join and, and he, he signed up for the draft. I, I investigated that. I assumed he bought his way out. He did not. He signed up for the draft both in, uh, in Maine and in Massachusetts because he was living kind of in both places at the time. They would go back for the summer. As near as I can figure out, he was never called up because they didn't know where he lived. Um, <laughs> he didn't buy his way out of it. He signed up for it. And I can't imagine that he wouldn't have died to go off with him. But his father, I think, didn't want him to. He was responsible for his mother and his sisters. The women in the family could never transact real estate business. It wouldn't have been considered proper. And so he probably felt that he was the only male in the family. Carolyn Crownishield had three sons. And um, so, you know, they could spare one if they, anything happened to them. This is Carolyn mourning her husband, Edward, who had died recently of tuberculosis. So he probably passed his disease on to his sons unwittingly. They didn't know at the time. But she became a great friend of Nixon. She was a great friend of Isabella Stewart Gardner. They visited all the time. So I know that Nixon and Isabella Stewart Gardner and Carolyn Crownshield were visited and friends with one another. Um, she was an interesting woman. She didn't have a husband and, and did a lot of things that a man had to do. At the time, she wrote kind of wonderful letters to Harvard. Um, and she was, she was a very interesting, deserves a book of her own. Uh, but Nixon just loved her. He, was, he spent the entire war in her parlor talking about Frank. That's what they did. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible, but um, that's what they did. And uh, she, um, she had wonderful letters from him. And the way I found out about Frank Crownshield was that he, he has a namesake in his family. Francis Wells Crownshield of Vanity Fair magazine was named after him. Um, her son, one of her sons was Vanity Fair Frank's father and he named his sons after his brother Edward and his brother Frank. And so uh, Nixon left Vanity Fair Frank $25,000 in 1928, and Vanity Frank didn't understand why. He didn't really know who he was, but I know that he just left it to him because he had the right name. <laughs> so I began to investigate which Frank Crown and Shield would have been the Frank Crown and Shield that, uh, that knew him, who was around in 1860, and it led me to a fabulous cache of letters at the Peabody Essex Museum <coughs> Please go and read them if you're all interested. Young Frank Crownshield's letters to his mother, to his brother, all mentioning Nixon, all talking about his family, are there to be read. They are fabulous Civil War letters. They are wonderful. And he writes back about everything that happened to him, all kinds of events. He set himself on fire three or four times. It's just full of adventure and craziness and um, wonderful Civil War stories. Um, there's actually a story of him setting one of George Nixon Black's night shirts on fire. Um, I wrote that into my book because that's interesting. And also there's a kind of a wonderful story where he's finished Sherman's march. Despite the fact that he was wounded four times, he was shot four times, he was shot always in the leg and then once in the arm, wounded at Gettysburg, Antietam, Winchester, and by a sniper at Raccoon Creek in Georgia. He still got back, TB and all, and went back into the army. It was so important to him to make it through because that was what he wanted to do was to get well. He did make it through. And he wrote his mother a letter at the end of Sherman's March saying, I've hoofed it all the way across the state of Georgia. I've done it. My leg is OK. And I don't know when this war ends how I will ever be able to lay down my sword. I don't think I'll be able to do it. But lay it down, he did. And he went afterwards the war. He survived the war. And then he went to Italy with Nixon. And they traveled the grand tour together. And he died in Albano of tuberculosis outside of Rome during carnival season and was eventually brought back. Here he's at Mount Auburn Cemetery. If you can't read the French, it says, without fear and without reproach. Less than a year later, his other brother died of TB, leaving poor Carolyn with no husband and two dead sons and only one son still alive, who became the father of Vanity Fair Frank Crown and Shield. <laughs> Now we enter a long period of time in which there's not so much to be found out about Nixon. I find him in opera records. I find him giving money to the MFA. I find him going to things at the MFA. I find him doing real estate deals with his father. Um, his father took him in business with him. They worked together. I would think that he would have hated it because all he liked was horses and dogs and antiques and um, fooling around, basically. And this is him when he's about 35 years old. This picture came from a friend of the, uh, one of the descendants of the people in his will. And this is him sitting with a friend's dog. He loved dogs. He had dogs throughout his life. Dogs are a huge fixture. There are rarely any photographs of him, candid shots, without an animal. And all the pictures of his house have little pet beds. 
under, under the furniture. Um, he had all kind of dogs and pets, but we don't know a lot about him at this time. Music, horses, dogs, visits to the opera, that's how it was, and working with his father. Sorry, working with his father. And uh, at that time, the family began to own real estate that they owned all of Blackstone's market. They owned real estate all around the Hay Market and Fano Hall. They owned real estate up and down um, Washington Street, but that was later. But, um, and at the time of the Great Boston Fire, they were lucky too. Not a single building that they owned burned. The fire burned right up to their property and stopped. And so they didn't actually lose anything during the Great Boston Fire, although they probably feared they were going to, but they did not. So all this took place during this period of his life. As I said earlier, George Nixon Black had two sisters. There was no other male in the family. His sisters were Agnes and Mary Ann. Here they are, Agnes and Mary Ann in Ellsworth. And uh, Agnes is the sister in black, Mary Ann the sister in white. By 1881, Mary Ann was dead, and Nixon's father was dead. They died within a few months of one another, leaving only Agnes and, his, and Nixon and his mother alive. After Nixon's father died, it seems to have been sort of a period of almost liberation for him. He was no longer really under his father's thumb. Not that the father, I think, ever treated him ill or that they ever disagreed, but suddenly he was the man of the house, and he wasted absolutely no time in making huge changes. He moved the family to 57 Beacon Street, and he was interested in Trinity Church, and they began to, to go to Trinity Church and, and worship there. Um, Nixon's father was quite in love with Phillips Brooks and his sermons, I know that from letters, but the family began transitioning to go to Trinity Church and Nixon was very interested in that and very interested in becoming more and more interested in being a patron. I think his friend Robert Swain Peabody, who we'll talk about in a minute, had kind of encouraged that in him. And he thought that maybe the, one of the best things that he could do, because Trinity Church was being constructed at that time, was to commission a window from John Lafarge memorializing his sister and his father which he did indeed do. Here's Nixon with his mother and two dogs. This is 57 Beacon Street, the house that he purchased and moved into. So he lived there from 1883 approximately until his death. Lived there with his mother and his sister Agnes. It's the house that has the Oriel window, it's far to the right, I mean to the left. It's still there, it's down near Charles Street, quite down near that corner, 57 and 58 are next to each other, with the white doors that have the arched roof. It's 1817, the architect was Ephraim Marsh, it's an old house. Trinity Church, you all recognize that, and this is how it looked at the time that Nixon was um, considering commissioning the window. And John Lafarge, the artist. John Lafarge was known for his innovative stained glass, particularly his opalescent glass, which was uh, a new method that he had conceived of. And he and Nixon actually had some sit-down talks about how to do the window. They discussed how the window was to ma be made and what subject. But Nixon, in the way that he was all his life, he asked the artist to work, and then he stepped away from it. He never told the artist what he wanted done. It's very indicative of him. He always let everyone have the reign that they wanted. I think he felt not capable necessarily of doing it. He let them do what they wanted. So at the time when Lafarge came up with the theory of the window, Nixon was a bit taken back by it because that was actually showing a bride and he was a little worried about his sister Mary and had never been married and it bothered him a little that there was a bride in the, in the scene. So, but that was, he, he never interfered with the artist. So here is John Lafarge, very talented, wonderful painter, perpetually short of cash. And here is the window. The New Jerusalem, it's called. It's on the Boylston Street side. If you walk there late in the afternoon, you'll get the best view. It is considered one of Lafarge's masterpieces. Those round little spots at the top. I've seen the window out. They actually just restored it, and I saw it taken down. And those little spots are like softballs of glass. They're big, th just like a softball, the size of them. So they're amazing. The technique is amazing. I have to learn more about John Lafarge than I can tell you today, but this is one of the great pieces of art that Nixon ever commissioned. Very, very fabulous. Robert Swain Peabody, another great pe person in Nixon's life and another great friend of Nixon. 
He was the architect of Cragside. Here you'd see the architect of the house that you all know so well. He loved to sail. He knew everyone in Boston. Whoever he didn't know in Boston were the people he were already related to. I mean, he just knew everyone. And he was a great, um, a great mover and shaker of his firm because he just knew everyone to, to get jobs from. He always was sailing. He loved boats and sailing. He lived at Peaches Point um, up in Marblehead eventually, but not at this time. But here he is with one of his sailboats. Uh, one of his granddaughters gave me this picture of him when they, when they came to visit me. And uh, he, people say that he and Nixon went to college together. They didn't. Nixon had already failed, flunked by the time uh, Peabody was in college. But they knew each other because Peabody, of course, was Frank Crown and Shields' cousin. Um, they're all related. And uh, that's how they, they knew one another. Peabody uh, studied at Harvard with great honors. He was on the rowing team. He's actually credited with... Um, uh, somewhat calling the, uh, the team the Crimson Tide because he was one of the, uh, the people on the rowing team who tied crimson bands around their heads so they could be identified. Mm -hmm. And there's a story that his wife was cheering him on, the other people saying Crimson Tide, the Crimson Tide, meaning they tied, tied with the bow, not T-I, tied with the bow. So that's a story. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I've read that. And he went off to Paris, studied for a while in England, worked at the, uh, went to the Cult of Beaux-Arts, and came back, and there was no doubt, he was just a super talented man, that he was going to be able to follow his dreams. He became one of the most you know, known architects in Boston. He built hundreds of buildings, hundreds of churches, hundreds of school buildings, were built buildings at Harvard. But Cragside remains his masterpiece. There's absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind that Cragside is the best house he ever built, the best piece of architecture he ever built. Um, and it was done for his friend, George Nixon Black. He also was responsible for bringing in Frederick Law Olmsted into the team, something that Black was very impressed with. He was impressed that his friend knew somebody so fabulous and famous as Olmsted. And uh, he didn't even think Olmsted would be interested in his six measly acres. But Olmsted said, no, no, this, we need to do it s such and such a way. And it needs to be left in a natural state, not looking like a public garden. It needs to be in its natural state and just worked up a little bit. And Nixon thought that was perfect and agreed with that. And so the two men, Olmsted and Peabody uh, really laid out the way the building was. And it was actually Olmsted who decided that the building needed the archway because there was no room, it's very close to the road, to turn a carriage around. So Olmsted fed Peabody the idea of passing beneath the house, and Peabody did the fabulous archway. So it's actually a cumulative effect between the two men. Peabody was a fabulous draftsman. Here are his designs for the front of the house facing the road and the back of the house facing the ocean. The house was built in a chevron shape, so it bent slightly in the middle. It's only one room wide. It's 4,200 square feet. It is nowhere near as big as people think it is. It looks massive in the pictures, 4,200. And here is the famous archway. This is later on. As you can see, the vines are grown over it. This is probably the 1890s. This picture actually came from Olmsted's archives. And here's the iconic photo of, of Cragside. You've all seen this photograph. I do have a little bit of secret information to give about this photograph that some people will be interested, perhaps yes or no. Um, at the time this photograph was taken, it was taken by George Soule Photographic Company. George Soule had sold the company, didn't want any really more to do with it. In the year this photograph was taken, three of the photographers that worked for him owned the company and were doing all the work for it. The most famous of the photographers and the one who was the best photographer was a man named Eric Ellis Solderholtz. Solderholtz was a well-known architectural photographer of the day. He became a potter and began making cement urns for people like Beatrix Ferrand and garden urns and moved to Maine in his retirement. So people will know him in his urns in Maine. So Eric Ellis Solderholtz may have oddly taken the picture here of Cragside. I think it likely that he did. And later on, Nixon bought many of those urns and pots for the house at Woodlawn. So they may have known each other from way back when this picture was taken. Just a little main side note that people would know who he is. The house was published many times, both in Europe and in the United States. This is from the American Architect and Building News. Fabulous drawings by a man named E. Eldon Dean, otherwise known as the Mad Delineator, because he did just a quantity of work. Um, it's fabulous work. And this is one of the most famous drawings of Cragside. This is a magazine spread. And the lesser known road view of Cragside, you very rarely see this picture. In fact, it was sent to me just a few months ago by someone, and I don't know where it came from or anything about it. 
but um, I never have seen it. I sure wish I had this picture when I was building it. <laughs> it would have been lovely to be able to see this side of it. Here's the only interior shot of the house. Lots of William Morris action going on there. <laughs> this was the room above the archway. At the same time that Cragside was being built, Nixon met the love of his life. This is Charles Brooks Pittman. <coughs> Charles Pittman was 18 years younger than Black. He was born on September 21st, 1860, the very day that Black was entering Harvard. So there's the difference in their ages. Pittman was born in the Sandwich Islands in Hawaii. His father was a um, trader and a merchant who lived in Hawaii and who had been married three different times uh, to women who died. It was not, he was not a wild man or anything. And Charles descended from the last wife of that family. Uh, so Charles, interestingly, had many half-Hawaiian siblings because his, his father married first a Hawaiian feudal princess which is a good way to get a lot of land in Hawaii. <laughs> and he owned sugarcane plantations and all sorts of other arrowroot plantations, lots of money. Um, he was as wealthy as black, nearly so, um, the, f the, the father. And, and Charles was a millionaire himself. Sometimes people have said that he was a secretary to Mr. Black, some of the servants, but he wasn't a secretary. He was well paid if he was, because he was worth millions when he died. But he was, um, he was from that family. He was interested in photography. He took many of the photographs of Cragside. He belonged to a camera club. There's more information about what he did. He was interested in art and antiques, a little more than Nixon was, and I think he helped Nixon become more interested in antiques. And he was from the era when colonial revival was popular amongst people of his own age, because he was younger than Nixon. So in this picture, he's 24 years old. Nixon is 42 years old. And Charles was better educated than Nixon. He had been to Stuttgart University and traveled there. He spoke and read German. He was there when his father uh, had taken one of his siblings who was ill to a spa in Germany in the 1870s. And he was enrolled at Stuttgart. I went there and tried to find his records. I found, I didn't find his grades, but I found his enrollment records and other records. His <coughs> grades were bombed by us during the war. So they were not there to be had. But, and then he later became, went to MIT, and he was at MIT when he met Nixon. He worked for the surveyor that surveyed the Cragside property. This is how I guess they met one another, but I don't know that exactly. But he, he did probably survey the property that Cragside was built on. But perhaps how they met one another. After they did met, meet one another, Charles thought it was no longer necessary to finish at MIT, and he never did, so he didn't graduate. <laughs> There's also very few pictures of him, he's hard to find. He had a brother named Harold, they were just the two boys, and then he had m siblings who were much older than him who were part Hawaiian. Here's Benjamin Pittman, his father. If you're interested in seeing him in real, you can see him at the Peabody Essex Museum with his wife, who was uh, Lila Kinahole, who was a Hawaiian feudal princess, a descendant of King Kamehameha, and considered Hawaiian royalty. So some of his children were considered Hawaiian royalty. They're buried in Mount Auburn with a Hawaiian royal shield on their graves because they are considered Hawaiian royalty. So he, had, he also had one son who went to the, fought in the Civil War. And I was pleased to be able to give that information to a Civil War society in Hawaii. He was very interested in their handful of Hawaiian Civil War soldiers because why would you be in the Civil War if you were Hawaiian? <laughs> but his, and this son did die in the Civil War of disease. One of Charles's half-brothers. As I said, I think Charles brought antiques into Nixon's life. He, 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 I think, convinced Nixon of how valuable the Woodlawn house was, how fabulous the antiques in it were. I, don't, I think he just considered his grandfather's house, as any of us might have done. Um, he didn't know really what it was worth, and Charles really extolled the, the wonder of it and told uh, Nixon how great it was, and they made lots of visits there. Charles much more enthusiastic about doing things. They set up a, they imitated, um, the Beauport Colonial Kitchen at Woodlawn, um, and they uh, collected antiques. They, we, we begin to see him going to auctions and buying paintings and buying antiques, where before he was interested but not buying or not as interested. I think Charles really spurred that interest in him. It really was one of the best periods of his life, and they worked together a lot, collecting fabulous things. He had fabulous early American silver paintings. He owned a portrait of John Trumbull, the, the famous self-portrait, which he gave to the MFA. He had a Gilbert Stewart of George Washington, which he gave to the MFA. Mm -hmm. um, he had fabulous things, which he left to the MFA at the end of it. 
And if you um, doubt their, uh, their devotion to the colonial revival, you have to remember that these two joined no clubs, but it didn't stop them from <laughs> dressing up as pilgrims here in Manchester for the Arbella reenactment. <laughs> this is just totally unlike them. And there they are, the two together. I was pretty pleased to find that. <laughs> At this time in their life, they were antiquing, they were gardening, they had built massive greenhouses up at, up at uh, Cragside in which they were doing specimen planting. They were entering their plants or their gardener, Axel Magnuson, was in different um, prizes. I read about them in the cricket constantly. That they lived together, it was not really hidden. They talk about them living together. They were, they were around all the time with each other. And at that time, George Nixon Black, Nixon got the idea to ask Charles to do something special for him, very out of character, really. He asked Charles, who had drafting, civil engineering skills, he asked Charles if he might design a building for a library, help remodel a building for a library. Nixon had never done anything like this before, and Charles did, and he did do the drawings for it. The building that they made into a library was the building where John Baptist's demise had been plotted. So I feel that Nixon was playing back his youth and saying, this is going to be a place in which books are available to all, and I'm going to have my gay lover design it. <laughs> <laughs> and that he did. And, um, the plans for this, this, this remodel, they remodeled this building into a library. Charles drew them. The plans exist with his name drawn on the bottom. They're his work. Um, nobody talks about this in Ellsworth, Maine, but it is, you've heard it first here tonight. He did, um, he did do those drawings, and it was remodeled to a library and gifted to the town uh, of Ellsworth, and just gifted as a deed. There was never an opening ceremony. He just conveyed it as a deed, and he never showed up for any kind of big thing or any of that, but he gifted it over to them. And it still is the library in Ellsworth today. In 1902, George Nixon Black's mother died. He had lived alone with her for many years. Agnes's other sister died one year after Cragside was built, sadly, of appendicitis. Um, she died suddenly. She had only spent one year at Cragside. So for 24 years, Nixon lived with his mother and with Charles. You often wonder what the mother thought. And I thought, what did the mother think? What did they think? So I actually went to her will and read that carefully. I also went to the will of Charles's mother. And in Massachusetts, people were at the time were named as executors and appraisers. Nixon's mother listed Charles as her appraiser. Charles's mother listed Nixon as her appraiser. I thought that heartwarming and very interesting that these are what the mothers thought about their sons. Um, you don't put people in positions like that in your will unless you're confident that they're going to handle it well. Nixon and Charles lived together for 34 years in, in, a, in a union of endearing fidelity. They were just great friends. This is the back driveway, the crag side. Um, you can see how much more land there was then at the time. There's a house there now. Um, but that was what it looked like at the time. Again, these were the happiest years. Nixon lived with Charles. They were just doing whatever you do when you're rich and have nothing, just whatever you want. So <laughs> it was good going. And th there they spent the fall and early winter in Boston. This is Beacon Street. This is what it looked like. And then they spent the late winter and the spring foreign traveling. Terramino is a favorite spot. And here is a newspaper article saying George Nixon Black of 57 Beacon Street and Charles B. Pittman, who makes his home with Mr. Black, are to sail on Tuesday on this ship. And so they, uh, you know, this was not a hidden thing. These, these little notes are in the newspaper every year that they went places together. And then in the summer, he would go to Woodlawn where he had a party on his birthday. He was usually there in July. These are his mother's relatives, not his father's relatives. Um, the blacks, he was angry with them ever since the fight about the first, the second wife. But these are a lot of his mother's relatives. And if people have read my book, you will notice that there is the dog Boxer, his St. Bernard. And he's got a big grin and a cigar, and I mean, life is good. And then they were at the summer and fall at Cragside. So here's Charles and Nixon, and of course, the ever-present dog and cat, <laughs> standing under the archway at Woodlawn. As an aside to seeking the descendants of these people, much of what I know about Charles is from talking with Pittman descendants. Uh, 
some of the Hawaiian relatives. And one of them came to visit me, and for the fun of it, we replicated this picture, I standing where Nixon was, and he standing where his great uncle Charles was, <laughs> and my little dog at the time. These were the good years. This is when Nixon was at his prime, 1902 to 1918. Here is Charles. By 1918, things changed. The war was raging, the well, Great War, the First World War, and the influenza epidemic was raging, and Charles was sick. He had developed nephritis. He was sick for about a year before he died, and he died during the height of the influenza epidemic of nephritis. He would have, of a disease, as near as I can figure out from reading, there are some doctor records, that he would have had to have dialysis today to have even lived and uh, he was only 58 years old. After that, life gets a little, little sadder for Nixon. He's really, the, the light goes out with Charles gone. He lived for another 10 years beyond him, and he finally died on October 29, 1928, of arterial sclerosis. He had a heart attack at his home in Beacon Hill. He did not die at Woodlawn. He did not die at Cragside. His mother did, and Charles did actually too. Charles died here up at Cragside. They took him away from the city. They thought he'd be safer up here, away from the influenza. So here he is in the other portrait that's painted by a woman, an unknown German artist named Charlotte Shetter, who I've sought out. I've got all her relatives, but I can't see any more of her paintings. I know every cousin she ever knew, <laughs> but I don't know her paintings at all. I can't find many of them. She was a very competent painter. She lived to be 98 years old, but where are her paintings? But this was one of them. He left Charlotte $25,000 in his will. He thought a lot of her. She actually copied some, some of his famous um, colonial portraits for him. She did copy work too. So she copied the Gilbert Stuart so a fake one could hang at Woodlawn where it would be safe and the real one went to the MFA. Less than a year after Nixon died, Cragside was torn down. It was given to Harold, Charles's brother. Harold lived in Cohasset and went coot shooting. He liked hunting. He didn't want to be on the North Shore. He wanted to be on the South Shore where he could coot shoot. And uh, so he sold the property to some people named Stackpole, who, interesting, were close relatives of Carol and Crown and Shield. But anyway, he sold it to them, and it was out of style, old, probably needed repair. And they tore the house down and built the house there called La Terrell, which is, goes on. And then La Terrell was torn down by them themselves. By the 1940s, they could no longer afford the house and tore their own home down. And then it sat until George Doriel bought it. And that's the story you know that some of these people here today. But that was story with Nixon. Characteristically, he's buried under a gravestone about as big as a bread box at Mount Auburn. There is no vast mausoleum. His name is carved nowhere in marble that I can find anywhere in Boston other than at the MFA on the wall with all the other donors at the Nevins farm where he left lots of money for the horses and here on this small little gravestone. Uh, there is a white pine tree over the gravestone, which I think is fabulous because it was the white pine that gave the family their original wealth, although the pine was just arbitrary. He didn't ask for it to be planted there. Check the Mount Auburn records for that, too. So, so really what I want to say is I want to introduce you, Massachusetts, to one of your heroes. You don't know a thing about him. You never knew a thing about him, but the list of the things that he did, the life that he lived, when he died, his will, Mass General, Trinity Church, Perkins Institute, the Colonial Society, Mass Ioneer, Children's Charities, the Nevins Farm, MSPCA, Fenway Studios, Woodlawn, the Ellsworth Library, numerous artists, and the things, the objects that he gave the MFA, as well as a large trust, which is one of the bigger bequests that they had ever received at the time, to do whatever they wanted with, with no restrictions whatsoever. The trust still operates today and is still buying objects and programs for the museum. So here he is. He's a really lovely man. Thank you. Are there, are there any, any questions? We have time for about two or three questions from the floor if anybody would like to ask Jane something. Can you just do a quick about your house up in Maine. I knew it. Okay, the next four <laughs> slides. The next four slides. I figured this was the question. And I don't want to put myself in this. But yes, I, I came to Manchester as a 19-year-old woman. 
I walked into the historical society expecting that someone would direct me to the driveway of Cragside where I could sneak in and take a look. I was sorely disappointed. Frances Burnett, who may, many of you may remember, had to break the news to me that Cragside no longer existed. And she actually drove with us in our car up to where the site was. It was Dorio's house at the time and showed me it and suggested that I go to the Boston Public Library and look for the blueprints, which we did. And the Boston Public Library said, you know, who are you guys? And well, maybe, no, not today. Uh, maybe you want to call the person who um, donated them to us, which was Wheaton Holden, a professor at Northeastern University. I called him and I said, I'm going to build Cragside. And he said, I think that's just great. That was exactly what he said. He invited us to his house, gave us all the blueprints, gave us all these pictures. Many of these pictures came from Wheaton, from his research. My research began with some of his. And I have to say that the story kind of comes full circle and that when I came back, again, one of the first places I went to look for research was the Manchester Historical Society. Again, when I was researching George, I found a letter from Francis Burnett that said, I well remember that young couple coming here. And I thought to myself, how could they ever imagine building such a mansion? They had a rattle trap old car, but they have done it and more power to them. And it kind of <laughs> made me feel, bad, feel strange. But anyway, yes, we did do it. We came to the Manchester Historical Society looking a bit like this. I'm about 20 in that picture. We had built much of the house. Then you can see it in the background. That's four dogs ago, too. Um, and that's my husband, Jim. And we did all the work ourselves. I do want to stress that every bit of this building was built by Jim and I, the electrical, the foundation, the blasting caps. Every bit of it was work that we did ourselves. From the footings, there I am with the same dog, doing the concrete on the footings, much younger and thinner. <laughs> Jim cutting out the archway all the way to the chimneys, and you saw it the other day. <laughs> <laughs>